So um, we're going to talk about where the future is headed. And um, I think some of it is going to be unknown. It's going to be as we get more and more uh, caregivers involved in this field, that there's going to be more um, insight, more creativity, and more uh, expansion of therapies that are going to be designed to improve the outcomes of fetuses with different types of dirt birth defects. But I thought I would talk about a couple of key themes. Um, first, this concept about the expanding number of programs, which we've already addressed with some of the discussion. Number two is treatment for diaphragm hernia. And then talking about some less invasive treatments and why that, what the pros and cons are for those. So the first fetal therapy program, the comprehensive fetal therapy program, which had all of the different specialists and caregivers that were doing open fetal surgery and fetoscopic type procedures was at UCSF in San Francisco. And the father of fetal surgery is, is a gentleman named Michael Harrison. So most consider him the father. But there were maternal fetal medicine specialists that were doing transfusions. In fact, they were doing open transfusions at some point in our history. And there were folks like Julian D'Elia uh, innovating with lasers for twin-twin transfusion. So there were other interventions taking place, but really our first comprehensive program where everybody came together was in San Francisco. And I was really lucky to have matched there in general surgery residency. And then in 1995, Scott Adzik, uh, Mike Harrison's primary partner, um, was recruited to Philadelphia to serve as surgeon in chief. And I actually went with him to be a research fellow at CHOP and uh, a fetal treatment program was started. And then the third program in the US, we started in Houston about 2001, 2002. Tim Crumblehoe moved from CHOP to Cincinnati in 2006 and created a program. And then in 2011, Tim Crumblehoe moved to Denver and created a program there. And then Vanderbilt really has a primarily only done fetal interventions around spina bifida, and they started uh, around the 2000 range or so. Uh, and then other programs started going. So SLU, Kansas City, Herman in Houston, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Ann Arbor. Oshner Clinic had a program for a short period of time. I believe it's stopped. Boston Children's, interestingly, has only done interventions related to uh, cardiac defects, and they really pioneered those. Uh, but since 2011, there's more programs expanding, and there are many under, under development. So uh, we've talked about this a little bit. I think the focus needs to be on quality, safety, and reliability. Um, of course, in the United States, there's complicated healthcare economics and market forces. There's consortia of healthcare delivery groups that drive care, um, and and they're getting there's fewer and fewer of these as as hospital systems buy up other hospital systems. Uh, there's competition. and and these forces sometimes interfere with collaboration. But the cool thing is, there's this North American Fetal Treatment Network, uh, otherwise known as NAFNET. And the concept is everybody with an interest in fetal treatment, fetal therapy, and fetal research to come together in a room or virtually in the current setting and to share ideas, to generate research. Uh, and an important thing is databases have been created. So I mentioned this earlier, there's a fetal repair of myelomeningocele consortium where everybody that's interested in in doing fetal surgery for myelomeningocele theoretically should share their data uh, for one to drive research so we can figure out a lot of things that remain unknown what's the best timing what's the best technique uh, are there inclusion groups that we can expand into and then also there's a huge database for laser photocoagulation for twin twin transfusion so I think Hopefully, uh, we can preserve those concepts of quality and reliability. Uh, of course, uh, and we'll see where the future holds or where we go. Let's talk a little bit about diaphragmatic hernia. I'm a pediatric surgeon, so this is something close to my heart. Uh, it's a pretty common anomaly. 
the problem is there's a hole in the diaphragm, but the problem is more than that because the guts get up into the chest and the lungs are underdeveloped. There's less air sacs and there's pulmonary hypertension, which complicates the cardiovascular physiology. And the bottom line is there's been great advances in neonatal care, but to this day, at least 20 to 25% of the babies of fetuses will still die with this problem, despite the best care. And despite what some people might say. And in fact, if we see this in the fetus earlier on, uh, the mortality is even higher, but that's because sometimes there's genetic defects or other comorbidities that can affect the outcome. We diagnose diaphragm hernia these days most commonly before birth. Uh, it's only the very minor forms that aren't diagnosed before birth. Um, these are two fetal MRIs. This is a fetus with left-sided diaphragm hernia. That's the right lung, the left lung, the stomach, and the intestines up in the chest. And then here's a second fetus. Um, that's the left lung, that's the right lung, and they look a little bit smaller than that fetus's lungs. And in fact, that is a reliable predictor that the one with the smaller lungs is probably going to have a higher risk of mortality or needing ECMO than the one with the bigger lungs. There have been a lot of fetal prognostic factors that have been studied and developed, but the most reliable are the ultrasound-derived lung-to-head ratio and the MRI-derived observed to expected total fetal lung volume uh, or the volume of liver that's up in the chest, how much of the liver has come up through the diaphragm defect. And these are the most studied and most reliable predictors of outcome. Uh, we did some research in this area looking at different predictors, and we looked at the lung-to-head ratio and the MRI lung volumes and the amount of liver herniation compared to a, a pretty good uh, postnatal-based risk stratification system. And we did find good discrimination of outcomes, not only for survival, but also for need for ECMO. So, um, but one other point I want to make is that um, the other part of this piece is the neonatal treatment. And I'll just tell you, there's lots of evidence that you want an experienced care team that has good teamwork, uh, working together with pediatric pulmonology, pediatric cardiology, uh, neonatology, in addition to surgical care. And it's best that there's protocolized care where theoretically we, we uh, ventilate the babies and provide different medications in support in a protocolized fashion uh, to achieve the best outcome. But despite these best treatments, babies still die with this condition, which is what drove Mike Harrison to think about fetal intervention for diaphragmatic hernia. There have been a number of treatments that have been used, and I'm gonna show you those. Uh, the first was open fetal repair. So this is a newborn that had open fetal surgery to repair his left-sided diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, Dr. Harrison opened his chest, pushed the guts back down to the abdomen, and he found that the abdomen was too tight. And the concern in the fetus is it's going to kink the ductus venosus, carrying blood back from the placenta. So he created this silo. And oh, by the way, this is a telemeter that was designed in collaboration with NASA that projected the fetus's heart rate. Uh, and the goal was actually to test other things, hemoglobin, sodium, and to transmit that remotely to the uh, observers outside of the womb. The only problem is, as uh, Dr. Basic may know, it's not good to have foreign objects inside the uterus. Uh, it it, it present, prevents pregnancy and it also tangles the membranes and umbilical cords. So this was abandoned eventually. <clears throat> the only problem with this open fetal approach, which was studied and actually funded, had some funding from the NIH initially, was that the most severe cases have the liver up in the chest. And in order to repair it, you have to push the liver down. And then that kinks the ductus venosus, which cuts off blood flow from the placenta. So then those babies die from that. So it wasn't a good strategy. Uh, they developed a LAM model. Um, there was evidence that if you occlude the trachea, the lungs will still make fluid and actually build up pressure inside the alveoli, which can cause lung growth. And it turns out that works. This was a LAM model. 
uh, which shows that with the trachea occluded, the lung grows so much it pushes the guts back down into the abdomen. Well, it doesn't work quite so cleanly in the human, um, but it does work. Uh, so we did open clip uh, application to the trachea. We did fetoscopic clip application. And then that's why an exit procedure got created was in order to unobstruct the trachea that had a clip on it. We knew that we had to deliver the baby partially. Here's the womb here. Uh, take the clip off. We scope the baby and then intubate and then deliver him. But the cool thing is this guy, Jan Depressed from Louvre in Belgium, developed this less invasive strategy where he puts one trocar into the uterus and he intubates the fetus and deploys a balloon in the trachea. And here's some photos of that. These are the vocal cords. Here's the carina, the two bronchi. And he puts a balloon there, and the balloon serves the same purpose as having the clip in place. And in Europe, this uh, became very popular, and a lot of fetuses had balloon tracheal occlusion, and all the evidence was positive. But in the United States, change was there were lots of obstacles to this, and many pediatric surgeons got up at meetings and said, oh, I'm good at, I, every baby that has diaphragm hernia that I take care of survives. Uh, and so there was lots of controversy and, they, and this again was not randomized data. So uh, it was slow to adopt. But the cool thing is there are two randomized trials that are gonna be completing soon uh, that are gonna prove what, the benefits of fetal tracheal occlusion. Uh, we did do this in Houston. Um, I participated in 21 cases. Uh, this is the balloon being deployed. Here's the vocal cords. Uh, these are some MRI images. These are the lungs before the tracheal occlusion, and this is the lung after the tracheal occlusion, and this particular child did great with that therapy. And here's some evidence showing the lung growth following tracheal occlusion. And then when we we compared 10 fetuses that had FIDO to nine matched fetuses, exactly matched for all the measuring lung volumes and lung to head ratios. Uh, it did suggest that there was an improvement in overall survival and the decreased need for ECMO, which is what they were showing in Europe. Uh, but fortunately, there's two randomized trials, one for fetuses with severe disease and one for fetuses with moderate disease, and both of those should be concluding uh, there were a lot of participation from international centers, including uh, some from North America, Australia, and Japan. Um, so we're going to have an answer, and I believe that uh, tracheal occlusion will become clinical therapy in the near future. There's a slight obstacle in that right now the balloon and some of the scopes are regulated by the FDA. And so it's a regulated, it, it's hard to get those balloons, even though it, they seem pretty innocuous. Uh, and the companies that make them are reluctant to use them in this high risk setting. So uh, we will, but if there's clear evidence, I think that'll loosen things up. So now myeloma meningocele, we talked about the open fetal repair, which is a gold standard, but this does seem to lend itself to doing less invasive approach, fetoscopically or even robotically. And in fact, we can maybe put tissue engineered scaffolds that can help enhance nerve growth and recovery and development. And in fact, that is being done. This is a fetoscopic repair. So it's important to know that the mom had the open incision. The uterus is exposed. It's just that the opening in the uterus is smaller, just big enough to permit a scope. And that's, that will have benefit because a tiny opening in the uterus will be much less likely to have rupture during a subsequent labor. However, it's very technically hard to get a good repair on the baby. Uh, there, ha there are a number of centers that have been working on this. Uh, Texas Children's is one, some folks in Sao Paulo, Brazil, a cardiologist in Germany, um, interestingly, got into this field. Uh, and there have been very mixed results, but just to summarize, um, it's probably better for the uterus, for the risk of rupture in that pregnancy and subsequent pregnancies, and it does permit vaginal delivery of the baby. So if you achieve a good repair, that mom can deliver vaginally, but the downside is 
there's a higher rate of premature rupture membranes. Uh, it's difficult to get a good repair. Uh, and there's higher rate of needing those babies needing other procedures after they're born. And it's much longer operative time. In fact, it could be three times longer operative time. And that could have deleterious effects for the developing fetal brain and perhaps for the mother. And then just very quickly, I'll talk about t teratomas and lung lesions and say theoretically, so the problem with the teratoma I told you was the circulation. So theoretically, if you could do an ultrasound directed or even fetoscopically directed ablation of the vessels, then that could be good. The problem is that there's risks of bleeding. And also if you successfully cause necrosis in the tumor, and there's still venous drainage from the tumor that's now necrotic, that could affect the baby that is already very sick with heart failure. And in fact, Greg Ryan, who's a big proponent of this, has basically shown that in five fetuses that he published, two that did not have high drops, so I would argue perhaps didn't even need intervention, had fetal demise, and then three that did have early high drops. So this is the the population that does require fetal treatment, and one did die, and two survived, but they were born about a week later. And I showed you my huge hysterotomy, and it was born 10 weeks later. So theoretically, it's a good approach, but it, it's been difficult to implement. And then for a lung lesion inside the chest, you could similarly do a similar thing. You could burn it, you could try to kill it, uh, and cause necrosis with radiofrequency ablation with a laser. The only problem is the chest is a closed space, and if you burn something, you'll cause inflammation. You might have swelling. I talked about tamponade physiology. And so the existing results from trying to burn or coagulate these lung masses has not been good. It has not been as good as my open fetal surgery results, but theoretically that could be an, an approach that could be used in the future, perhaps with different technology. So uh, key takeaways are that fetal surgery is increasing worldwide. There are new techniques and approaches that are gonna need comparative evaluation in order to figure out what's best. And that open and fetoscopic approaches are limited by healing of these amniotic membranes. And we really need to work on this scientifically. Thanks so much.